Hello and welcome. Secret no more. The CIA, America's uh, spy agency, has just released nearly 700 pages of declassified documents detailing decades of illegal activities. Known as the Family Jewels, the information was compiled in the 1970s in response to the CIA's involvement in the Watergate scandal. Among the mostly unflattering gems are details about assassination attempts, domestic spying, kidnapping, and behavioral modification studies conducted on civilians without their consent. Some of the information is even comical at times, resembling a clumsy film script rather than an international espionage affair. Well, on today's show, we look at uh, the impact of the CIA's secrets revealed and ask what has changed since those days. Don't forget, you can contact us with your questions via phone and mobile text, and the numbers are at the bottom of your screen. Joining me now from Chicago to discuss this is Stephen Kinzer, a former New York Times reporter and best-selling author. His most recent book is Overthrow, America's Century of Regime Change from Hawaii to Iraq. Stephen Kinzer, thanks very much for being with us. Good to be with you, Rez. Thank you, sir. Well, I've got to start off by asking, what is the, uh, you know, the significance of this? You know, why are these declassified documents important in any way? I think uh, there's an importance that goes beyond the specific content of individual documents. When President Bush announced the invasion of Iraq in 2003, many Americans and people in other parts of the world complained that he was ripping the United States away from a long tradition of cooperative diplomacy and thrusting America into a new role, a role of a country that would go halfway around the world to start wars and overthrow governments and try to uh, interfere in the affairs of other countries. Actually, this isn't true. This is not something new. This is not a new innovation that George Bush uh, brought to the White House. The United States has been actively intervening in other countries and seeking to overthrow the governments of other countries for more than 100 years. The value of these documents is simply to remind us of that. It's very important to look at these interventions and these overthrows of foreign governments not as a series of unconnected episodes, but as part of a long continuum that stretches over more than a century. These documents help us do that. Well, I wonder, I mean, the fact that they are, there are declassified documents that the public can get their hands on them, and we'll touch on a couple of stories which involve your own investigative work in, in, a, in a moment, but does that really indicate there is a freedom of information uh, in the USA? That's a very interesting question. We have a Freedom of Information Act, which is actually quite sweeping. Uh, and I think it's a great achievement of American government. It's far, it gives far greater guarantees to the public than the public is given in many other countries. Uh, the problem comes in its interpretation. Many of the decisions that have to be made on classifying or declassifying documents uh, are administrative decisions. And those are decisions made by people who can change with one administration to a next. Uh, what's happened is that when the United States has had a president and a CIA director committed to openness, more, of the, more more documents come out. But uh, in recent years, there's been quite a clampdown, and even documents that were formerly secret uh, are now being classified. In fact, in these new family jewels, there's actually uh, one document uh, released that was already released some years ago, and the copy that was released some years ago actually has more in it than the one that was just released yesterday. So I don't think it's so much that there are dramatic secrets coming out of these documents. It's more the broader story they tell of American intervention. Well, it's interesting, Stephen. I know you, you've got a, a good history with sort of your investigative work. You've actually filed for a CIA documents, um, which were, after a long battle, I gather, you had released on the 1954 coup in Guatemala. Tell me about that, because you co-authored co a book based on that information. It's true. Uh, I wrote a book about the coup in Guatemala in 1954, and during that uh, investigation, during the period I was writing the book, uh, my co-author and I applied to the CIA for a number of secret documents. Uh, we were denied, and we went through a lengthy administrative process uh, that ultimately did result in the release of a number of documents. In fact, we later learned from documents released years afterward that some of those documents we requested were slated for destruction had we not requested them. I think this is also one of the things you always have to bear in mind when the CIA announces that it has released everything it has on a certain episode. You have to ask yourself, well, what is it that it doesn't have and why doesn't it? Not everything is kept. Right. It's interesting you're able to get that. Now, in, we have a, a couple of viewer emails. I want to put one of them to you. It came from Rex 
in the USA. Uh, and really, this is thinking about those people such as Rex who feel that maybe there's a, a need to protect U.S. interests when it comes to the CIA and how much of a free, ha free hand the CIA should have. Rex says, I fully support the CIA's efforts to destroy all enemies of the United States of America, including citizens that promote the decomposition of American ideals. So I guess there are some who want to be able to put their trust 100 percent in the government. I actually have no problem with America defending American interests. In fact, Americans are a little bit uh, childish about this sometimes. We don't like to be told that our government does things to defend American interests. Uh, this is not really true in other countries. You know, I used to live in Turkey when the Turkish government would send troops into northern Iraq and the Turks would ask, why do you do that? They'd say, well, it's in our interest. We're Turkey. We do what's good for Turkey. So I don't have any problem with the U.S. doing what's good for the U.S. What I would just like is that when America does something to further its own interest, we just make sure before we do it that it really is in our long-term interest. Too often, we intervene in foreign countries in ways uh, that seem successful at first, but after you wait some years, you begin to see that we've actually developed a situation that not only is disastrous for the target country, but actually weakens our own national security. So when the U.S. intervenes in other countries, we need to look for results not just immediately, but we need to think about what are going to be the long-term results and ask ourselves, do these interventions really serve our own interests? In fact, I want to touch on that subject uh, in a moment on, with your book, uh, All the Shah's Men, about Iran, because that's a, a perfect case, I guess. But let me get an email to you that came in from, from the UK. Paul, Paula Varley in Norwich in Norfolk in the UK says, felonies were clearly committed against US citizens. Will there be any prosecutions? What about Henry Kissinger, who knew about the foreign operations? There's nothing in these documents that I think is going to lead to anyone being prosecuted. Um, and certainly one of the reasons why the U.S. has opposed international justice mechanisms like the International Criminal Court is exactly the fear to which you refer, that some senior American officials might find themselves uh, in trouble. As you know, Henry Kissinger, who you just mentioned, uh, already has a list of countries that he won't visit because he's afraid that under their laws he might be vulnerable to being arrested there. Uh, but I can assure you that uh, when the CIA releases documents, it purges everything that could lead to individual responsibility. Now, interestingly enough, uh, on that subject of Iran, we had a, an email that came in from Rob Timmons in Oregon in the USA, and Rob says, what jewels have been revealed about the 1953 coup in Iran? Do they strengthen the claim in Mr. Kinzer's book, referring to, of course, uh, all the Shah's men? Um, is immunity part of the deal for releasing these documents? Uh, no, because there is no one who needs to be rendered immune. As for the documents that have to do with Iran, we didn't learn anything this week that we didn't already know. And I think this teaches us something very interesting about the way CIA documents can actually be used. After the U.S. overthrew the government of Iran in 1953, um, the CIA created its own internal report to be used in training other agents about exactly how that operation was carried out. Now, uh, it wasn't until several decades later that that uh, report was leaked to an American newspaper reporter and published in the New York Times. Now, that's a very, very important CIA document that told us a lot that was not released by the CIA. Uh, it didn't compromise any sources and methods. It did not embarrass any particular individuals. But the CIA would never release it. And it shows you that sometimes the most valuable documents inside the CIA come from people who work in the agency and want information to be made public and are frustrated that it's not being made public and do it themselves rather than from documents that the CIA officially declassifies. Now, Stephen, I'm, I'm guessing that based on what you're saying there, uh, with, with technology the way it is and everything being electric, uh, electronic now, uh, emails and so on, and e more easily monitored in theory, I guess uh, it's much harder for leaked information to get out. I mean, the kind of information that, uh, that you had regarding Iran would be probably a lot harder to get nowadays, I guess. You know, the uh, job of covering an intelligence agency is always a challenge for journalists. Um, nonetheless, uh, there are people inside those agencies that want uh, truth to emerge. Uh, if it doesn't uh, hurt national interests, there are many who feel frustrated with the policies of their agencies. So 
I think uh, as long as there are people with conscience on both sides of this uh, divide between the press and the CIA, uh, information is going to continue to emerge. You made a very interesting point uh, at the beginning saying that, you know, the fact that uh, there's information coming out now about the things that happened, this is nothing new that, you know, these kind of activities continue to go on. So I guess the declassification of documents, the revelation of some of the things that the CIA and the government has done, perhaps don't really change anything as far as the way the agencies, the intelligence agencies work. I think one thing that comes through in these documents, and it's something very important for people to bear in mind when they look at the CIA and its activities around the world, is that this agency was not a rogue elephant going crazy and doing things behind the government's back that no one knew about. Actually, the CIA has always functioned strictly within the laws of the United States. It has always received the uh, permission of the CIA director and whatever other officials are necessary before embarking on its acts. This agency does not deserve the blame for its interventions in foreign countries. It is an executive agency. It is carrying out operations that have been authorized by the government of the United States. And I think that comes through often in these documents, that things were approved at a high level and the CIA did not go off on its own and do something crazy without authorization. Well, that's an interesting point, especially as, you know, obviously people know that there are the covert activities. One of them uh, very relevant to the to, you know, the, the public even, even now is the ongoing uh, attempt to remove Fidel Castro from Cuba. And of course, the, the assassination attempts against uh, um, Fidel Castro have been documented, as some of them being almost like quite ridiculous, such as exploding, you know, fancy seashells and things like that. The obsession with Castro uh, is something that has guided uh, American foreign policy for half a century now, and, and it's true, some of these plots do seem to, to border on the comical. Uh, nonetheless, I think uh, there was a sense, uh, particularly coming out of the 1950s, that the CIA could accomplish almost anything. Don't forget that the uh, first two CIA coups, the one that overthrew the democratically elected government of Iran, in 1953, and then the one a year later in which the democratically elected government of Guatemala was overthrown, were accomplished very successfully, very easily, with a very limited expenditure of funds and to the great satisfaction of the United States. This gave the CIA and uh, the government in Washington a sense that they had found a brand new tool for intervention and they could marvelously make their foreign policy problems go away. This is what led them to the belief that they could easily overthrow Fidel Castro at the Bay of Pigs. Actually, the former CIA director at that time said if the Guatemala operation had not gone so well, we never would have even tried the Bay of Pigs. And it was uh, the frustration of the failure at the Bay of Pigs uh, that led the CIA and the U.S. government to engage in this decades-long pursuit uh, of Fidel Castro. It was a way of trying to win a battle that we had originally lost on the shores of the Bay of Pigs. I wonder then, based on your extensive experience in covering uh, the agencies, you know, wh how you assess the way things have de developed over the years. Do you, I mean, uh, on, based on that experience, do you have any faith in the way or how efficient the agencies are in what they do? I think the agencies uh, can be very efficient. The question is more what are they sent out to do and what should they be sent out to do. It's not uh, any more tenable, I think, in the modern world for one country to make such a profound decision that the regime in another nation uh, is so far outside the norms of civilized behavior that it needs to be destroyed. It's particularly f frightening when the decision being made by what we call one country is actually being made by just half a dozen people sitting in a room. Uh, we need to find some broader way to legitimize international action uh, in these kinds of cases. It's not so much the question of the CIA's ability to carry out its orders. What I think uh, the release of these documents needs to make us uh, think about once more is the question of what we want these agencies to do. And in a democratic society, one that is seriously interested in protecting its long-term security, not just resolving uh, problems of the day, what is the proper role for an agency that's charged with covert intervention abroad? And how much is that complicated, Stephen, by the fact that there seems to be a growth in the number of agencies, particularly post 9-11, um, now that there's a lot of news coming out uh, from time to time about how the agencies can compete with each other, often uh, sort of confusing or at least confounding each other's attempts to, to achieve anything? 
One of the most dramatic stories in the history of American intelligence has unfolded over the last few years, and that is essentially the disappearance of the CIA as the key U.S. intelligence agency. It used to be that the director of the CIA was in to see the President of the United States every morning for a briefing. And now the CIA director is just a relatively low-level bureaucrat who has to wait in line to get in to see the president. There are layers of bureaucracy in between him and the president. So the CIA has now been greatly reduced to the level of being just one partner among a number of agencies. And uh, you're quite right in saying that this new system has produced uh, confusion that has weakened the ability of the U.S. to focus on the threats that we face. A oh, quick thought with about a minute to go, Stephen. Where do you see uh, agencies uh, down the road? Say we're looking at another 20 or 30 years down the road and what might be revealed. Can we really expect anything, again, anything juicy to come out? Absolutely. I think that just as we're now reading about things the CIA didn't want us to know 30 years ago, there's no doubt in my mind that the same thing will happen 30 years from now. We're going to be reading about what happened in, uh, in Iraq, what happened recently in Venezuela, um, what's happening in Iran. Uh, there are all sorts of covert operations that uh, people are now carrying out with the idea, we'll deny it, and then 30 <laughs> years from now, when we're all gone, we'll admit it. <laughs> well, God willing, we'll all be around 30 years from now, and if the show's still going, we'll get you back on to have a look at what happened. Stephen Kinzer, thank you very Maybe much. Maybe I'll have a book about it by then. Thank <laughs> we'll you very much. We'll definitely get that on. Thanks. Okay. Thank you for being with us. As tomorrow's show um, is uh, what we promised you earlier in the week, we talk with former Abu Ghraib interrogator Tony Lagoranis about his dark journey through Iraq. Do join us for that. Don't forget, if you have any thoughts on uh, that or pressing issues around the world, send your emails to riz at aljazeera.net. We'll see you next time. Street Talk is next.